Hey everyone, welcome back to Stage 3. Uh, our next speaker is Grace Chi, and she'll be talking about CTI, Behind the Curtains for Cyber Threat Intelligence Careers. Take it away, Grace, thank you. All right, uh, thank you everyone. And I'm uh, gonna pull up the comments now. Um, if there's any sort of issues, feel free to uh, send them in chat. I'll try to monitor them. As far as I know, there might be like a three to five second delay, so I'll give plenty of time. Um, thank you so much. I see some comments already. You're amazing too, Jessica. All right, so welcome to CTI, Behind the Curtains for Cyber Threat Intelligence Careers. Today, we're going to cover the basics about what threat intelligence is. Maybe you're somewhat familiar with it. Maybe you do a little bit of it in your current job, or maybe you know, you're just checking out all the different options you have within the threat intelligence and the cybersecurity space. You're all welcome. Um, hopefully, we're going to keep it high level, get you introduced, and then we can jump into some questions, some tips, and some resources uh, if you're looking to expand further in the career. All right, moving forward. So a little bit about me. I'm the co-founder and the COO of Pulse Dive. I spend a lot, a lot of time working with different threat intelligence pros, home hobbyists, huge organizations and their teams across like every level of threat intelligence maturity. And we'll get into a little bit about like what maturity looks like and what that current landscape is within uh, security right now. For me, it's really important to get more talent from all walks of life into this expanding and critical path that's becoming quickly integrated across the entire security environment. I'm a personally a huge advocate of interdisciplinary backgrounds. I have a little bit of behavioral neuroscience. I have a little bit of art history. I have a little bit of visual arts and uh, like just a bunch of different hobbies and passions in my life. And to me, they all really importantly impact my career and my work too. I love working, um, always enjoyed startups. And so that's what I wanna bring back into this community and also help other people who are interested, who have different in interesting diverse backgrounds and perspectives work together and bridge the gaps in security. And also congrats, Dwayne, who just got their uh, threat intelligence cert and MITRE attack. Very important, the attack framework. And finally, a uh, quick note, I was talking to somebody earlier who's like, you can't send emojis in the chat. You actually can, and that could be kind of fun. If you open up like Emojipedia or any of you know your other keyboards that has emojis, you can copy and paste them. So feel free to send them throughout this session. As part of my job, because I work within a threat intelligence data and platform vendor space, I'm talking to people at all levels all the time. They're researchers, they're from academia, they're from um, uh, government groups, they're from you know commercial sectors as well, and they're all across the world. And so I get this really unique perspective talking and listening to their issues, and then also seeing what makes teams successful, what kind of investments, what kind of skills really help grow individual careers as well as grow CTI programs. And so part of that is, oh, and I see a lot of people are sending emojis. Yeah, looking good. Um, Part of that is bringing it back to the audience of folks who might not have access to this type of information. And if we step back, like why why talk about CTI careers? Like why does the Diana Initiative, you know, try to invite different folks to learn about security, blue team, purple team, GRC, red team? And this is something that is related to any, any new project, any new initiative you're taking on. Stage one, uninformed optimism. That's when, let's say, somebody's looking to pivot in their career and they, all they see are blue skies. They're just so excited. You know, cyber pays well. Uh, you get to really make an impact. What you're doing helps protect organizations and helps protect citizenry. And, you know, you can learn and it's a great field, which it is, 100% it is, but you don't know everything that's going on. And then you start to get involved and then you move into stage two. And that's informed pessimism. You're starting to see a lot of barriers. Everything feels hard. The benefits of you know what you've tried to take on move further and further away. And unfortunately, I also see a lot of people getting really frustrated, feeling like they cannot really start to grab onto a CTI career or they're applying to a lot of jobs, they're not able to get it, they're inundated with pressures to get a lot of certs or other qualifications. And that's where you get into stage three. That's the valley of despair. And what I like to unprofessionally call the big sad. That's where you 
are almost burnt out. You feel nothing but imposter syndrome. You really are like, I can't continue. There's no way I'm going to make it past this. Um, I'm. It's it's too difficult. I don't get it. Um, and then that's where a lot of people might quit and repeat phase one through three, where you try something else and you either do push through or you don't. The talk here today is to equip you with some knowledge, some advice, some frameworks about how to look at a threat intelligence career if it's interesting to you so you don't quite dip that low in the valley of despair. Um, <laughs> I saw somebody just say that the valley of despair is real. Yeah, it is. And this isn't just for your career. Could be when you start a new job, could be when you start a new hobby, could be uh, your attempt at getting healthier and exercise. And it's really important to understand where you are in these mental states and also get resources to help you so that you can get to informed optimism. That's stage four more quickly. That's where you understand what priorities you need, what work you need, what effort you have to put in, and you're starting to feel like you're getting there. You're able to contribute. You're able to teach yourself and make an impact in your organization or protect your home environment, whatever that is. And then uh, stage five, which is you know nirvana. That's where you have found success and you feel like you're fulfilled, that you have a purpose. And this happens at micro and macro levels too. And every time you bring on something, you can and you may go through all of these stages. So once again, when we're talking about all of this, you don't have to feel pressured to remember everything. You don't have to take screenshots or crazy notes, but feel free if you do. Um, it's just so that you might take enough nuggets of knowledge out of here so that you can guide your path and you could understand what to be worried about, what not to be worried about, what foundations you need to have in place. Kaya, yes, uh, lots of emojis. I threw these in actually last night because I thought it was just a little bit more interesting in the presentation. So today, getting into the nitty gritty, Cyber Threat Intelligence 101, wh wh what does CTI stand for? CTI in action, just an example of what a day, uh, what a program, what your job in CTI looks like, and then tips and resources, uh, just some things to leave you off with, some hyperlinks we can also send out in the chat as well. I might be able to post the comment uh, later when we get to that point. A quick snapshot of the audience. How familiar are you with CTI? And feel free, I'll give you a few seconds just to send in, you know, you don't even know what it stands for, or like maybe you took a course, or maybe you took a general course that had like one day of CTI, um, or, you know, it's your job. You could tip, you could honestly be presenting it right now alongside me. So go ahead and type that in the chat. I'm seeing some comments coming in. And while we wait, I'm going to show you, I mentioned earlier, and I want to live up to it, I do a lot of crafts in my spare time, like non-digital, get away from the screen, refresh my mind. So I have plants, but they're not living plants. So while we're doing this first poll, this is my plants versus zombie plant. These are actually perler beads that I created in a little pot. This is the bean shooter, pea shooter, pea, pea shooter. And this is the sunflower that you can buy more plants with in Plants for Zombie. So they sit on my windowsill at home. All right, just looking around. All right, doing a little in your job, very familiar, following and reading along, took a general course, somewhat familiar, perfect. Exactly the right audience. So moving in, let's get into a mind melt. What are some keywords related to the definition of cyber threat intelligence that you might've been familiar with, that you think are relevant, um, that you've learned about in your studies? So I'm seeing, you know, security operations center people using CTI. Yep, yep. <laughs> I see people now are, are loving the plant. Um, I'll show you, actually, I'll show you another one while, while we're here. Um, there's taking course, threat hunting. Yes, of course. I'll show you a small one this time. I also get into miniatures because they don't take up that much space, but they take up a lot of time, which is a great uh, hobby during COVID. So here's a tiny, I don't know if my camera looks good or not, tiny little potted plant. And then here's a tiny little, I don't even know what they're called. Does anybody know what this is? Little bead. And I have little cafes and stuff in my house, shelves full of these things. All right, checking out chat now. Um, IOCs, of course, indicators of compromise, threat actors, threat groups, APTs, behavior, CNC, so infrastructure. Yes, excellent. All of that is related. So let's define cyber threat intelligence. 
I'm going to go to uh, Gartner, who's, you know, one of the big voices on the block and, and their, their definition. It's evidence-based knowledge, including context, mechanisms, indicators, implications, and action-oriented advice about an existing or emerging menace or hazard to assets. <sighs> okay. This intelligence can be used to inform decisions regarding the subject's response to that menace or hazard. So in cyber threat intelligence, it's all cybersecurity related. Every vendor, every single kind of group might define it a little bit differently, but if we boil it down, it ends up being data that becomes contextualized, that informs action steps, things to do. And one thing I really want to debunk right now is what CTI isn't. In this space and in security, a lot of people tend to conflate just technology with whatever that domain is. So CTI is not just having a notebook, a dossier with every threat group or APT. It's not consuming every expensive feed or free feed um, and having every tool in-house. It's not even uh, having a dedicated team member or provider. Um, and it's not ingesting every indicator, every IOC that you can find. And it's not OSINTing all the things either. And the most important of all, when you're you're moving into this career or you're just talking to people about CTI, it's, it's never set it and forget it. That's something that I have to remind users, clients, prospects all the time. CTI is so inherently ingrained in an organization and their threat landscape that over time you are optimizing, but it's never like, let me turn some things on, let me get some workflows going, and then, okay, great, it's, it's just working. The threat landscape is changing every day. Threat actors are changing. Um, your own environment is changing. And that in and of itself is important. And intelligence in regards to that is also changing all the time. to provide some context about CTI as a discipline. SANS Institute has been doing a CTI survey every year. And so I pulled in some data from their 2021 survey and they've had five years of history here, which is great. Does your organization produce or consume CTI? So five years ago, 60% of the surveyed respondents replied yes either producing internally, consuming threat intelligence, it's part of kind of their security posture. Over time, that number has gone all, gone all the way to 85%. And that's, that's a pretty significant majority. On the other end, 25% five years ago had said, not yet, but we're planning to. It's somewhere on the horizon. We know it's important. We just need our budget. We need our time. We need somebody who can come in house and really help us operationalize. That number has dropped down to 15%, which is the entire remaining amount of respondents. So what does that mean? The 15% left over from 2017 that had no plans, didn't care, and no CTI for us, no thank you, that went to zero. So everyone's changed their tune. So either they are now involved in some level of CTI production, consumption, or they have it on their plans. When it comes to being a CTI practitioner, wh where do teams exist, right? Um, Pretty standard for the rest of the industry, but there's a lot of vendors out there who produce CTI, who have CTI tooling. A lot of times they are doing a lot of cutting edge research and they're both startups and very large organizations. There's consulting, so MSSPs, managed detection teams, CTI specific teams. So they are professional services that work with many clients to help them get their CTI in order. Um, there's government groups as well for local, state, federal. And there's institutional, academic, healthcare, nonprofit, for profit. And finally, commercial. That includes enterprise. Finance probably has some of the best well known fusion centers. And there's also manufacturing, supply chain, just really any commercial sector. Um, they all have different levels of cyber threat intelligence ingrained in their security programs. Now, who, who and where, right? Like, how, do, how does that look in a company? Going back into the 2021 CTI survey by SANS Institute, most organizations have formal dedicated teams or at least some sort of shared responsibility across security groups. Um, so overall, if you look, 55%, 56% have a combination. That means some in-house, maybe some external services, professional services providing uh, context, information, uh, finished intelligence for them. 
the in-house segment is 36.5%, but that has grown 5% in the last year. So that means that more organizations are bringing more talent, like purely in-house to work on cyber threat intelligence. And about 7.5% are just pure service providers. So kind of like outsource consultants providing threat intelligence. And honestly, I don't know what that like 0.01% other is, but uh, feel free to put your best guess in the chat. And as far as the users and the contributors to threat intelligence in the ideal world, it's across the entire organization. But most commonly right now, it's found in security operations teams. There are CTI teams, um, often, too, you'll see it involved in incident response or vulnerability management. Moving out from there, um, risk and com compliance, sometimes when they're doing assessments and audits, uh, CTI can come into play. Executives and leaderships, even if they're not necessarily uh, cyber focused, they need un an understanding of their threat landscape and what actions, what budgeting, you know, how to plan moving ahead in their strategic roadmap, um, and as well as other business units. In addition, Customers and end users play an important part, as well as red teams and different abuse research. CTI at this current moment is not really an entry level job. You can take some classes, you can do a ton of research, but very, very, very often uh, CTI is a specialization, maybe like two, three, four, five plus years down the line. And they can come from security operations, security consulting. Um, digital forensics and incident response is a very popular kind of feeder role into a cyber threat intelligence specific uh, career. And also security engineering and system administration too. People from IT often find themselves in CTI. And two other less traditional paths, um, government and military intelligence. And wow, I'm getting an absolute downpour. Hopefully you can't hear that, but if you do let me know and I'll try to adjust my audio. Military intelligence, they're very familiar with socio-political, geopolitical information and creating important uh, reports. So that translates very well into cyber threat intelligence as well. And finally, technology reporting. So being able to understand technology, find sources, write information for a specific audience, that in and of itself is a great skill to have. And so you'll see all the different kind of components of those jobs. The skill sets that work really well for threat intelligence are writing and reporting, technical research, digital forensics, networking, scripting is always, always a plus, but not necessary, and data analysis. It does not mean that you need to do all of those things, but kind of out of the box, they all are immediately useful in a cyber threat intelligence role. Um, I saw somebody in chat mention that, you know, they did research, couldn't really find entry level jobs. It's true. Sometimes they do have security analyst roles that have a focus on threat intelligence. And if you have some OSINT kind of skills or some projects you've done, it helps. But typically, typically threat intel is something that happens a little further down in a cyber career. And so now we talk about like currently like what's happening, right? Even when I put this slide together a while ago, I mean, it's only it's only gotten worse. And it, this is not about FUD at all. It's just there's double extortion taking place where not only, you know, do you have ransomware and everything you have encrypted and, you know, you do or you don't pay up, but then your private information, sensitive information may be leaked. Um, hackers are working for hire. There's affiliate groups and they're really coalescing as like a legitimate business um, enterprise where, you know, there's subscription services and they're growing more sophisticated in their capabilities, as well as, you know, there's just a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of gaps, a lot of targets that are open. And there's just massive growth on both sides. And so threat intelligence, it's its not going away. I think it will evolve over time, but truly, and this graph shows you just the number of leaks. That's even just one slice of the puzzle here, the number of leaks that took place in 2020. So the job, so your career in threat intelligence, why? Your job includes understanding. That means you have to have a really good grasp on the context of your organization, your security, the strategy that you need moving forward. You need to do, right? Those are the things that you're familiar with. You're mitigating, you're detecting, you're protecting. You need to optimize. Always need to be thinking about how you can improve things over time, how to get the right resources and operationalize and build your priorities. And, you know, at the end of the day, like everything else in security, you're protecting the bottom line, whether that's 
personal private information, whether that's finance, whether that's helping the business keep going and keep growing. And so the intelligence cycle underlies the entire discipline, right, of cyber threat intelligence. The tools all just support different parts of the cycle. The, the staff are helping apply the cycle into uh, the different organizations they work for. And so I'm going to try not to get too like jargony here and just keep it fun, but walk through what each stage of this means. And really, at the end of the day, this is relevant to many different careers as well. Just the process of planning, collection, processing analysis and sharing information back. Planning. You start with what do we care about? Why do we care about it? You're setting a purpose. You're setting your scope of your project, of your job. You're conducting stakeholder interviews, the people who will care, who will be doing things with intelligence. You're setting core objectives. You're learning how to measure. Uh, you're understanding your goals and what tasks you might be setting up with KPIs, key performance indicators. And you're also understanding the current risk landscape, your users, your consumers, and also your capabilities, what you can and you can't do and what you need to start doing. Then you move into collection. That's where you have both internal and external sources. Um, you might be familiar with this. There's network logs, past incidents. Uh, you might be getting risk analysis reports internally. Um, externally, you might be consuming threat feeds, uh, just reading blogs or scraping Twitter for IOCs, right? Um, you might be looking at TTPs collected from vendors on both the open and the dark web. And so what the collection phase is all about is what data do we need and, and from where? But data in and of itself is not enough. Like, what does a single license plate mean if you're at a store and you're trying to protect against criminal activity? It doesn't help. So what you need to do to go from there is to process. Processing includes enrichment and contextualization. You're taking a little data point, an alert, a log, an IOC. An IOC can be a URL, an IP, a domain, a hash. And you're finding more information about it. You're looking at the narrative. You're doing uh, correlation as well. So that you can find things from OSINT engines, uh, different, a lot of different tools out there. You can conduct scanning. Um, you can do footprinting. You can also conduct human intelligence and social engineering. Go out into forums. You know, you have an informant who can tell you more information about what they see and what they know. And that also includes trust groups, asking people who've been doing work uh, related to something, what they know, and having, you know, like uh, private shared conversations. And that moves into analysis. With an analysis, you're then creating intelligence. And this requires a lot of sophisticated strategic work. You're now sussing out, you're building out motives, targets, behaviors, uh, impact, right? How much does this matter? What is at risk? And then from there, you're producing actionable reports, inform narratives to then protect your organization, protect whatever you're protecting, and inform decision making and next steps. So that's like like what recommendations do you put in place? What needs to get done right now? What needs to be in budget next time? Because, you know, this is something that is high risk. And so the, the key point here is out of all that collection, all those data points and all the context you get, sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not so helpful. What matters? Why and to whom? Which audiences need to know? And this is the final point, which is there's a lot of really interesting conversations in threat intelligence right now about sharing and the importance of effectively sharing your intelligence. This is dissemination and then getting feedback so that you can iterate and improve next time. You have to select your format, your output, how timely, when and where you're gonna bring this up, what meeting or what email, and the distribution of intelligence. Is it public? Is it private? Is it only to executives? Is it to your security engineering team? With clear actions and considerations, context that these audiences need to know about, plus uh, just like feedback, getting feedback, what was useful, what isn't, because you need to improve over time. And this drives at who needs to know about what you just created, and what do they need to understand? What do they need to walk away with understanding? And this means you sometimes have a whole breadth of research that's done. And one group might only need the headline. Another group might need all of the technical mitigation measures that need to be taken place. Another group might need a write-up in a different format. Um, and this is absolutely essential. And then the entire cycle starts back again. 
if you read, you know, any of the major vendor blogs, they're a great place to start just to familiarize yourself with like what, how do they determine a target? How do they determine motive? How do they determine uh, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures of a threat group? But it can feel very um, far away, very distant. So just a short, quick example of what threat intelligence looks like, even for just a regular, you know, you, me, home hobbyist. In 2020, we were getting a lot of really weird links uh, that includes related to, you know, COVID, related to vaccines, related to PPE. And uh, sometimes, including yours truly, you get stuff from family members or friends or, you know, older folks who might just be like sending links out and it might sound really scary. And so a lot of times if you see those links, like internally, you know something's wrong and you've already assessed that what matters to you is, you know, your financials, uh, your private information, your, of course, your credentials. So if you see one of these links, if you go off into an OSINT tool, um, I'm just showing Pulse Dive because I, you know, I know it's safe to use. I won't get in trouble to showcase this example. If you plug it in, you might be able to pull context here, some, some information like screenshots, or if they're using a meta description for Facebook, which was true in this case, and you know that that's being suspicious, you know that something there's wrong, and they might be trying to steal passwords. For what reason? You can do more research, or you can just say, like, it's likely that you can take your stuff, maybe try to get money out of people you know, pretend to be you, um, see what other information they can get, right? Pivot within your environment to uh, further, further provide attacks. And so now that you've done some processing, you know, just like a little bit, you want to disseminate that information. You go out, you tell your friends, if you saw this, don't click it, first of all, don't click it, don't use it. This is dangerous. Make sure you block it. Uh, if you think there might be something, change your password immediately. That's you providing a report in a very light way, of course, to your friends and family. That's you giving action items. And so that's like kind of the smallest microcosm example of threat intelligence at work. And of course, you can report it to registrars or report it to open fish, and they will also take more actions to help protect, you know, um, the community. Going back into the kind of high level, large CTI teams, there's a huge variety of maturity levels. On one side, there's CTI on a budget. Uh, that's the photo of a college, you know, microwave and, and fridge, where maybe a team that doesn't have that many security resources has somebody who's like an analyst or even an IT person who's starting to look at intelligence, try to do more research, try to write reports and respond to requests for information. And that's CTI on a budget. They're kind of going with free tools. You wear a lot of hats. Um, definitely starting to build out resources, trying just to understand what you need at all. There's a lot of people out there in the commercial space as well as in you know other spaces. A lot in the middle. This is the kind of a mess where it's like collect them all, but maybe don't operationalize everything. There's a lot of tools. There's some standards. There's some workflows in place. But at the end of the day, it's very disjointed because there are so many new tools taking place, new functionalities, um, and teams are having trouble finding out how to integrate it properly, how to get the most value out of all their tools, or if they're collecting a lot of feeds, how to denoise that, right? Make sure they don't get false positives and reduce also false negatives, which means you're not getting alert on every single IP that comes in, but you're also not missing anything too important. And then on the last side, yes, there are some very mature fusion centers. They usually hire, uh, very robust teams, very, very specialized skill sets. They have a lot of great tools and they also have just a lot of investment in, and that's kind of the Iron Chef Kitchen where they know, you know, it's not a solved problem, but they're creating a lot of intelligence for the community. They're processing a lot of data. And uh, if you ever have the chance to work somewhere like that, it's really great too, because you get to see what the top of the industry looks like. At the bottom, I just, peppered in some terminology that you might see. It's it's messy. Um, don't feel too overwhelmed trying to understand everything. Like security as an overall domain, I will tell you, even in trust groups where they're just the smartest people you know, they don't know everything. They're focused on uh, one sector or a certain threat actor group or certain technologies or certain types of exploits or certain type of attacks. They don't know everything either. And that that's where really sharing intelligence is very important and knowing what network of trusted partners you have can help a lot in the threat intelligence space. So networking early and often so you 
know what sources to be looking at or you know where to be sharing intelligence as you're getting it that might help another group or you know somebody that you used to work with uh very critical from the technology standpoint which is you know not end all be all uh but right now very commonly in an example flow there's a lot of intelligence so that could be domains or ips urls vulnerabilities and also news and advisories unstructured data going in a threat intelligence platform is a pretty common way to dedupe, to enrich, to correlate, and to kind of start processing that intelligence and then having analysts manage that actively to curate it for an organization. But that's not always the case. Um, I have talked to some folks who have their intelligence in Excel sheets, lots and lots of Excel sheets, very large Excel sheets, um, in slideshows. And, you know, it's a little bit painful, but I've also heard that they kind of have intelligence, but it's just living in email threads, but it, it quickly does outgrow that once you're starting to really collect and, and look at, you know, past information. Um, I see some, okay, Tim, thank you so much for sending some uh, definitions out. And then from there, you know, the threat intelligence platform is your database, your analytics layer for managing your threat intelligence. But, you know, how, where does that operationalize? Of course, you're writing reports, you're sending uh, advisories out, but you can also push your intelligence uh, block list, uh, automatically enrich indicators or alerts with indicators in your security information and event management system. And that's correlation, that's detection, and that's alerting. And also, like, more recent years source, security orchestration automation response. Moving forward, what do you expect? Um, there's nothing mind blowing here, but if you're looking at a career in threat intelligence, if you're looking to move into the space, I have a couple um, findings from just talking to a lot of individuals. One, continued growth. That's why I'm here talking to you. There's gonna be more training, more investment uh, from across the board and from the board. That's my cheeky way of saying like leadership is going to require threat intelligence, the ability to know reports, the ability of you know, your threat landscape. And then also uh, as far as the marketplace, new technologies coming out and a lot of uh, market consolidation, M&A. There's some really large news recently too about some threat intelligence platforms that were being acquired. Another piece is investment towards hybrid semi-automated processes. And that's not replacing an analyst, not replacing a CTI researcher by any means, but it's just helping with the monotonous work. So that's correlation, deduplication, the integration and automation from getting your steps done. And also in dissemination of your intelligence. Next, and this is really exciting, refinement on threat intelligence requirements. So that definition, that curation. The last five years, there's a lot of like, just get everything we need, get everything that we can afford. But now it's like, let's think really carefully about who our stakeholders are, what their needs are, what they need to understand, what are our you know crown jewels, and then really tailoring where you're getting intelligence, creating your own means of intelligence, producing intelligence, right? Your own um, information that you're saving and sharing in house and then measuring the efficacy of your program. And finally, and I hit on this a bunch of times because it is very important, the emphasis of sharing and trust building across and within organizations. And you'll see like uh, Stix Taxi is an example of standardizing threat intelligence information and data. And that can be used across both formal and informal coalitions uh, informal includes like trust groups, like there's discord groups out there that they share some sensitive information. They work together because, you know, no single team alone can can handle a lot of the requirements when, you know, major events are occurring. And then improved awareness across internal business functions. So CTI supporting the integrated security program, red team, purple team, blue team, et cetera, and then being a factor of, you know, having a presence across business functions, marketing, sales, just everyone, executive teams as well. Getting in, um, I love this slide because I get to tell stories of other people and the cool things they've done. You'll see that I plopped some examples of kind of like pick and choose your adventure of how to get in. And the reason it's like messy and the, the lines go everywhere is because even on Twitter, you'll hear people arguing all the time. It's important to get certifications. You need to have your own lab. Uh, no, don't do that. You need to be involved in groups. The reason why there's controversy and drama is simply because there's no clear answer. There's no one path. 
So you can feel what works for you and then start getting involved. Um, I like telling stories where, of course, work experience, working in IT, having intelligence experience can help. But most people have multiple things going for them. And um, for example, like getting involved in social media, I was talking to a woman, Mary, who had come from, you know, some always loved computers, but thought Threat and Tell was cool, didn't have any of the traditional qualifications, but was following a, a bunch of different researchers and, and practitioners in the space, saw a job she thought was interesting, wasn't trying to go for it, but reached out to the poster or somebody who's promoting the job. They had a conversation. She actually landed that job. So she's six months in now and she's loving it and she's learning about how to write reports, how to do a lot of Googling, how to do a lot of OSINT. Another example is um, Dorothy, who I absolutely appreciate. I had the chance to connect with her over a Share the Mike and Cyber campaign. And when she first came to me, she was like, I was surprised at how many women of color were in security. And I thought, like, what? I've never heard that before in my life. Out of talking to thousands of groups, there was only one time that I was uh, with working in a room just full of women. And it's because she was parts of of volunteering and networking groups that had more equal representation. And so when she did hit some challenging areas or sometimes that felt demotivating, she had a group of cohort that could, you know, work with her and help her. And I think that's where it really struck out to me that like the Diana Initiative or Dave Security or Empower Her are really important here as more people are moving into the space. And of course, you know, she worked really hard, went to a boot camp networked, got an internship in a slightly related field, and then just continue networking internally to land her first CTI job. So it wasn't, you know, just one to one, but as you're building this repertoire over time, as you are working on your personal projects or you're posting or you're following researchers, um, things will come back too. One last pro tip, and this came from a senior uh, threat researcher from Proofpoint. If you are reading threat research reports, blogs, you see their name of the authors and you really liked it, reach out, say thank you, say, oh, this was really interesting. Say that you're interested in intelligence and you know you really appreciate the work they did because they work so, so hard and sometimes they post and then it just kind of goes into the ether and they know they're doing good work, but it always helps and it, it makes their day, honestly, to hear that somebody out there is reading their work, appreciating it, it's helping them. And the threat intelligence kind of professional career, for the most part, they're very open. They're very willing to help. They're willing to answer questions. You know, if you are looking at something and you have like a critical eye or you don't quite understand or you want to replicate their research, um, feel free and don't hesitate to kind of step in and just get engaged. And finally, participating. There's, you know, nothing's too CTI specific, for, from my experience, most groups are, you know, invite only just because there's a lot of sensitive information taking place, but you can check out the new to cyber uh, SAN summit that took place for the first time. There's an international consortium of minority cybersecurity professionals. Alice in Cyberspace is close to my heart because it's based in New Jersey and it's an event that happens every year um, for women in security. Girls Go Cyber Start for any of the younger um, folks who might still be in school or in college looking at cyber careers or just messing around with some like fun CTFs. And um, also I have a Diana initiative, Dave Security Empower Her as well. I'm going to, while we're here, I will copy these links for anybody in the audience because they are blogs, they are playlists, they are a great way to start collecting some information and let me know if Diane Initiative allows me to post this much out. Um, FAQs to getting started in CTI, how you move from journalism to CTI, discovering a pathway. Um, they are all really important narratives and different experiences of folks who got into threat intelligence. And once you're ready to really like dive in and mess around, learn about tools, learn about frameworks, get some free resources, go to Awesome Threat Intelligence, which is a GitHub repository by Herman. He's collected like so much information. It will blow your mind. So you have to know what you're looking for, but really valuable. And then uh, the last point, CTI, uh, SANS has a CTI summit every year. They publish a lot of the presentations online. So you get to hear exactly what the CTI discipline is looking into, talking about, concerned about, um, you know, technical research, how to be a better writer, all of those content. And that's all on YouTube, all for free, all public. 
And finally, uh, thank you to all the references for all the important folks who are doing research that I referenced earlier in the presentation. Thank you so much. So um, if you want to connect, and I highly encourage you, you do, you can go to Twitter and follow me at Euphoric Fall or add me on LinkedIn. And my uh, handle is there, Grace SG. Oh, last note, while while I'm popping out, and Tim, you can kind of close out. I don't know if we're in a rush, but um, this is something that I created. This is my last plant that I'm sharing with you guys. This is a watercolor, so I painted, um, and then I folded the papers, and then I plugged it into another one of the pots that I had. Actually, a leftover plants for zombie pot um, with rocks and, and toothpicks. And so this is, you know, my longest living plant to date. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with me, ask them here. If I do miss them here, you know, go ahead and ping me on uh, social media as well. I see that somebody asked, where was the GitHub repository? If you Google Herman Slapman or just awesome threat intelligence GitHub, it will show up. And yes, as Tim mentioned, uh, please leave a review. Good, bad feedback. I want to hear it all. Go heavy on the good feedback, though. No, nah, I mean, no, nah, I like <laughs> criticism. It's good to know what to do better for next time. I'm, I'm sweating over here, actually. Um, the thunderstorm stopped, though, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that. My lights flickered for a second, so could still hear. Um, so yeah, this was this is really good. It's also very interesting. There were not a there was not a constant feed of questions for you, so you're either very in tune with what everyone wanted, or um, they're sleepy, but <laughs> there were there were questions, so I have a feeling it was a you you really tuned into what people are looking forward to. I know I threw a lot out there, and one thing that's important is like sometimes like even when I was getting started, and you read a blog, it's just like so many so much jargon, like so many terms, threat groups, you know, pick any number of letters and and symbols, and that's kind of like you're reading, and it feels like gibberish, and it's really overwhelming. Like at the end of the day, understand the foundations. Even if you're not working in threat intel, if you're in security, understanding threat intel is really important. So like, wh why are you doing that? And then from there, kind of learn each component. And I'm reading some of, I, I didn't get to catch everyone's comments earlier. I think a lot of people just like the plants and I'm happy to hear that. Like, should I do that again in my future presentations, show more of my crafts, my arts and crafts and my paintings? Definitely should do more plants. Okay, and I do have a whole shelf. A second here at the end to, you know, say very uh, you know big thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors that make this possible and uh Danish should have would not happen uh without without them so i don't know if they're still open but if they are go check them out at the event expo and here's a little way you can get to them i just posted in chat and um yeah there we are and I see a comment, by the way, just for, for Charlie. He said, make it a wall to background. I encourage you to add me on any social media platform <laughs> and then ask me about my Pokemon sprite wall. Uh, I literally a thousand Pokemon sprites in my living room. I will send you a picture. All right, great. Um, Thank you, everyone. Great questions. Perfect, yeah. Oh, and thank you, Ryan. I see Ryan Chapman's in this chat. I really appreciate that he's saying nice things about us. Ryan's also awesome. I think he had some talks, so make sure you check that out. And I think, I don't know if I'm allowed to share, but you're working on some really interesting coursework where you might want him as your instructor in the very near future. And don't forget to check out the closing talk here at the end of the day. And it has been a pleasure 
it's been a pleasure for me listening to this uh, to, to your your presentation, and I th I thank you on behalf of everyone who can't actually speak in chat right now. So, thank you. I appreciate that. And while we, you know, while we are up, I think a bunch of folks were sharing uh, their own information. There's no shortage of resources in threat intelligence. It's just very disjointed. So if you have links, feel free to send them in too. Um, I know somebody mentioned MITRE ATT&CK. All of that is open source. Yeah. You do your own research there. DEFEND was also released recently by MITRE, a different group, but related. Um, all good avenues to start, but if you feel like way overwhelmed by what all of these, you know, different stages and, and terminology means, just step back and just start looking at some blogs, start following some influencers in the space, and then kind of curate your own intelligence that way as you're learning. And say the number one problem you almost could boil everything down to is a vocabulary issue, is if you move past that word that you do not understand, whether it's you know just an acronym or a specific word in a report, you're going to have a misconception uh, about everything you learn beyond that that builds upon it. So that's uh, awesome advice. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of acronyms, a lot of abbreviations, and even group to group, organization to organization, they don't always agree, or there's aliases up the wazoo. So never feel like you know you don't know something uh, google is your best friend and uh also asking people and building your network people who do know also your best friend i think i have a newton's telecom dictionary version one billion i just keep growing sweet all right um, should we call it here and then everybody can migrate on over to the closing session? Uh, yeah, I, th I think so. So everyone, if you were still here, well, thank you for staying. And now go over to the um, the rest, the either the, not the Expo Center, the main stage or the socialization area and get your last few LinkedIn contacts connected and be here for the, the closing. And Thank you so much. And thank, thank you so much, Grace. All right.